Good evening everyone. Welcome back to my channel, True Crime with Jess Rose. And as I mentioned last night um, on my video, uh, which was the Soho murders, um, tonight I want to talk about the um, Phil Potts case. This uh, case appears on Britain's Darkest Taboos and Faking It Tears of a Crime. And um, oh, it's, it, it was just such a a shocking case. Um, this was back in 2012 and it was in May, sorry, 2012. And it begins with a phone call from a woman, distraught woman, saying the house is on fire, um, her children are in the home, she can't get in. You can hear her partner um, screaming, he can't get in you know, really, really distraught phone call. You hear the phone call on both um, Faking It Tears for Crime and Britain's Darkest Taboos. You know, really, really a harrowing phone call because you realise that there are six children in this house. So, obviously, the emergency services get there, um, you know, get into the house, and one by one, they bring the children out. And... But uh, one boy one they're laying on the laid on the um pavements outside the house and the emergency services or the ambulance and paramedics they do their best they do their best um but five children pass away there and then um it said that it would have been through the smoke inhalation um but one child um he was 13 his name was Dwayne he was um, he was fighting, he was, you know, they rushed him um, to Children's Hospital straight away and to try and get him help. Now, this was in Derby, this case is. And um, the address was actually 18 Victory Road in Derby. Now, this address was notorious, um, you know, it wasn't the first time people have, had heard of the fill pot because when the, you know, the fire was put out and it was, you know, people learned there were six children in the house and the valiant attempts of all the neighbours, you know, of course the press were there. And one of the reporters who appears on the show uh, says the minute he heard it was 18 Victory Road. Uh, no, I think it would, no, he heard it was Derby and he thought straight away it's the fill pot and when he had heard the address, the full address, he knew. And the reason for this is Mick Philpott, the children's father, had been in the press for the past five years and basically began with him appearing on Jeremy Coyle. And the reason being was the fact he had so many children, um, 11 living with him. Um, I believe he's got 17 altogether, but 11 living with him, with his wife, Maraid, and his second wife, as he called her. Now, I'm not going to say her name because in both shows, they don't say her name. Now, I do know her name and you can find out, but because it's not mentioned in the shows, I'm not too sure why. So I'll just say his second wife and I, even though they were legally married. So they're both, you know, a bit unorthodox family. You know, you've got him, like I say, married, this second wife. And between them, they had 11 children. Mariah had six and the other one had five. And they're all living in this three-bedroom house. So he goes on Jeremy Coyle, you know, saying how, you know, he deserves a, a four-bedroom house. They're in a three-bed council house. He wants a four-bed house or a five-bed house. You know, he's called a stranger. Now, Mick doesn't work at all to provide for these children. Mariah and his second wife, as he calls her, they work and he keeps the money and you know this is what made him uh, it made him interesting watching you know that this guy was so shameless and that's what he became that was his nickname shameless mick and in 2007 Anne Whitaker, um who was um, a government minister she had spent five days with the Philpots. And, you know, she appears on the show as well. 
and she just says he was he was very charming at first he showed her around the house he thought it was going to get him you know tv coverage and he'd get this bigger house he thought you know this has put him in a good light somehow and he shows around the house, obviously, very small three-bedroom house. You've got 11 kids, three adults in it. Oh, you can just imagine. So he's got a caravan outside, which he proceeds to tell her he um, swaps his wives, his wives nightly. So he has one, 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 one. You know, just sickening. It wasn't charming. It wasn't, uh, he didn't have charisma. He was just cringe. And... She she doesn't buy any of it, and with come and she starts calling him out on it and saying, "Why don't you work to provide for these children? Why do you you know do you take all the girls' money and you know going basically her lying a few times, get a job, get a job, and he didn't like it, and she actually admits on the show, um, she thought at one point he was going to hit her. She actually believed he was going to hit her at one point. Because there's a bit where he stands up and he, he, he come on, bitch. He swears at her. He swears at her. And you can see it on the program. He does look quite intimidating. And it just, rather than, you know, him getting a bigger house through this and looking anything other than a, a vile man, you know, he he didn't get anything from me. But he carried on. He carried on appearing in the press for the next four years and stuff. So he was known... So when this fire happened, this tragedy happened with these children, one of the reporters says automatically he knew who's behind it. He knew me somehow, some way, was behind this fire. Not that he intentionally uh, meant to cause his children harm, but somehow, some way, this was his doing. So uh, Mick automatically blamed his second wife and I'll tell you why he blamed her a couple of months previous she'd had enough and she packed up took the kids only in the clothes they were wearing and um, left and the day now this happened um, in, in the my log site and he had a court appearance to get his five children back the morning of the fire so the following morning and it, she was supposed to she was appearing in court and instead she's picked up and accused of this horrific crime it, it's terrible um very quickly uh what from the investigation she'd done nothing she had an alibi nothing to do with her whatsoever you know we tried to make it a revenge thing which is is disgraceful could you imagine being accused of this? You know, the whole country's mourning. You know, five children have died and, you know, another one's fighting for his life in the hospital. And you've been accused of, ah, oh, just be horrible. But she's, she's removed from the investigations. Um, and like I say, everyone's gotten a suspicion of me. There's no, no evidence to suggest anything yet. So, uh, five days later, um, Dwayne, the last child who was 13, lost his fight. He lost his fight. And so it was six children. Six children died in, in that fire. And, you know, um, the Phil Potts, Mick and Maraid call a press conference um, on this fifth day. And that was odd. That appeared odd to the place because it's never usually the family that would arrange a press conference. But he actually phoned all his contacts that he got from all his appearances over the past five years. And he, he calls them all to this press, start, press conference in Derby. Uh, I think it's Derby Conference Centre. And that was very unusual to begin with. And then he comes out uh, holding tissue to his face. You know, him and Maraid looked they did look distraught you know so if they hadn't have spoken or he hadn't have spoken you know I don't think anyone would have questioned it at that time but it was when he opened his mouth uh, you know he looked every part that you know the the distraught father 
But when he spoke, he was very controlled, very calm. Um, he actually, when he'd begin to cry, he'd say, bear with me a minute while I cry, kind of thing. It was, it was shocking. It was surreal. And he proceeds to thank the the neighbours that helped. You know, there was two brothers um, that I've seen a couple of programmes on and they've never got over this, um, the Butler brothers. It's very, very upsetting if you ever watch an interview with them because they really tried to get into these children. They they really did and they get upset in every interview. It, it's heartbreaking. So he proceeds to thank them uh, quite rightly but thanks to the emergency services um you know all the neighbors the the hospital everybody he's thanking everybody see his six children have just died and he's saying how grateful he is and the the lady on the show on faking it tears for crying the profiler she says the last thing you would be if your six children had just died, he's grateful for anything. So, you know, right from the get-go, everyone's like, what is he talking about? You know, and then he'd stop and he'd cry. Then he'd come back and proceed to tell everyone that they're going to donate Dwayne's organs to help another child. Um, you know, uh... There was just so much, but what was missing, he didn't ask for any help in solving this crime. Who set fire to his house? He's organised a press conference that you would believe would be an appeal. Please help me find who has done this, who, who set fire to my house. He doesn't say any of that. He, 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 that gets missed completely. And then all of a sudden, by the way, she sat there, um, you know, and the watcher on the show, Faking It Tears, he actually says she she's doing a fake cry like a child. And when he says it, you see it, she's like this. She's literally like that. And the profile, um, the watcher just does say that when it's genuine, your mate does go down, but your eyebrows go up. And unless you're genuinely upset, it's a very hard thing to do. And what she's doing is if you ask a child to say, oh, be sure, or they, 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 they want something like that, that's what she was doing. That's the face she was pulling. And I think they were on there for two minutes and however many seconds and get up and walk out. And as he walks out, he does this kind of, you know, real anguished cry and goes out and it's just all the press even the people at home are left thinking what what have we just watched so you know it again like a lot of these stories i'm doing it's their ego um and uh, sociopathic tendencies would you say that put them make them want to go on camera for these Oh, despicable crimes. And they're putting themselves out there. It's just unbelievable. So, by this point, obviously the police are, they're on to them. They're, they're on to the, the Phil, Phil Potts now. They're not looking at anybody else. So, the Phil Potts haven't got, obviously, a home. You know, it completely burnt out. And the, they're put up in a hotel. Well, with the permission of the um, chief superintendent, um, they bug, they bug, I think it's a holiday in or something, and they bug it. And pff, they didn't need to do anything else. You know, he he fell into that trap straight away. You know, they um, started having a conversation uh, about what had happened and, did you cry when the police were interview, you know, interviewing you? And she's like, I did. And he was like, was you crying a lot? She was like, well, I was quite, sort of crying. This is the conversation they're having. And he's like, they haven't got anything on me. You know, they haven't got anything on you either, have they? You wouldn't want anything. I mean, six children. 
and they're, they're plotting about how they're going to get away with it. Their parents, their parents, these aren't random people who happen to think, oh, you know, set a fire and it's gone wrong and trying to cover it up. Their parents, this is, in the meantime, uh, they were acting really odd, not, not just behind the scenes where the, obviously the hotel was booked, they're acting out in front of, you know, in front of everybody and their neighbours, they, they were calling around the neighbours. No, the community was amazing and it's such a shame that once again, you know, a, a really kind community has been taken advantage of uh, because they all clubbed around, you know, they knew they'd lost everything and, you know, they raised a lot of money for them. But what Mick and Maraid were doing was going around their their friends' and neighbours' houses in brand new trainers. She was pointing out to one of them, these cost £80. We're talking a couple of weeks, if that, since their children have died. And she's flashing a pair of trainers. And um, there was an incident where they turned up at the pub, the local pub, and it was a karaoke night. And someone's got up to sing Suspicious Minds, Alvis Presley, Suspicious Minds. And Mick, Maraid with him, wearing matching Stetson hats, um, he stands up and he starts singing Suspicious Minds. And his friend had to say, listen, you've got to go. You, you and her have got to get out of there because people were turning and you can't blame them. Because initially, obviously, your heart went out to this couple and very quickly, you know, even if they didn't have anything to do with it, it'd be bad enough. But they're, they're parading it. I mean, oh, it's just, it, you can't, it, it's, you can't believe it. And so that they booked the hotel room, like I said, sorry, I'm still in shock at the fact that he started singing at a pub. It, it, it's just, it, it, it's blown me, <laughs> just to even repeat it. But the police have now got enough and they charge them. They charge them with the children's murder. Um, and they're still being escorted. Um, so they haven't been locked up as such, but they've, they're being escorted through police vans and, you know, through the hotel. And the police van is booked. And as they come out, he starts again, you know, they've got nothing on me. You know, and she's like, well, what about, I think there's a, a, a fingerprints on the window or something and he's like that's all they've got it's nothing it's you know circumstantial he's so cocky so cocky that he'll never be caught and you know just keep quiet and all this will be over with and she's just going along with it it's the, it, it's crazy um so when they're investigating the fire they realized it was started in the hallway um and what caused it to go up so fast was there was, he'd varnished the stairway. You know, your banner star, he'd varnished that. The carpet were man made fibres, uh, very poisonous. And the window at the top of the stairs was left open. And slowly but surely, they work out what happened because the fire was started inside. And they find uh, petrol on, um, Maraid Philpott and Mick Philpott's clothes. But there's also another gentleman, and it's their friend called Paul Mosley, and they find petrol on him. But not only that, he would visit them at the hotel. So they picked up on him being involved as well. Now, apparently, on the night in question, it comes out that Mick comes up with this cunning plan, and the other two go along with it, and his outcome is believed to have been that he could set fire to the, to the house, get the kids out, be the hero, um, blame his ex-partner on it. Like I say, he had a court case the next day, so he was hoping to get custody back of his children and get, like I say, get a bigger council house. So he thought he had all bases covered and this was only going to go in his favour and wrote the other two the mother, the mom, into believing this was a good idea. And 
they set but but like I say with between the varnish, the man made folders, the window being open, it all went up. No you know, no one's saying that he went out with that intention or her or the or the family friends, you know, but they they didn't care. They didn't get why would you take that risk for a bigger house or to frame your ex partner so you can get your children back just so you can claim more benefits because that's what all this was all always about it was always about Mick getting more of what he felt he was entitled to the bigger house more money you know it, he had a long-standing history of just being a very very selfish and very violent man now in faking it tears for crime it doesn't show the history of Mick but it does in Britain's Darkest Taboos. I would definitely recommend watching it because he was a, a boy man from the get-go. Uh, back when he was 19, he was in prison for seven and a half years for stabbing. Um, he stabbed his partner. It was 30 times, 30 something times, and left her for dead. Uh, when he, well, Sorry, when a mum tried to stop him, he stabbed her 11 times waited for the paramedics to come um, because they'd been, you know, the police had been called and stuff. And when they burst open the door, he was just sat on the stairs after stabbing his partner 30 times. It's no point, um, you know, helping out. She's a goner. I did a good job there. And he got seven and a half years. They let this man out again. And, you know, a lot's been said about Maraid. But from ex-partners who were always young, always vulnerable. You know, Dwayne wasn't Mick's son. Mairead had him when she met Mick. She was vulnerable, she was young, she was 19. He did the same with his so-called second wife who also had a child when he met her. She was 17. You know, she was actually bridesmaid at Mick and Mairead's wedding. <sighs> Just... But he had a way of manipulating and, you know, getting round these girls. And he was a bully. He was a bully as well. Because once he charmed them and got round them, he just controlled them then. And it was, it was, you know, they were controlled through fear. At the same time, she was their mum. And I don't care how much, you know, that people say, oh, she was controlled. And, you know, no. No, she was their mum and it was her duty to look after them children and not allow someone to... So what, an, what, what a plan, you know. It, it's just... It, it's really hard to get your head round that they actually did what they did. So, in the uh, court case, Mick was found guilty of murder, of course, um, and he got life. And I believe life means life with him. I haven't heard of a minimum term. It's, it's life. Um, Maraid and Paul Mosley, they each got 17 years and were charged with manslaughter because Mick, Mick didn't care. But I, I think Maraid and Paul n never thought in their wildest dreams that would have happened. You know, that would have been the outcome. They were just so stupid. You know, to believe, to believe him, to believe in him and go along with it. it it's just, oh, it's just, it's so, it's such an upsetting case, six children. So what I'd like to do is, you know, Mick and Mariah have, have, you know, been mentioned a lot. And in these shows they are, you know, it's, it's about them. But I think also, you know, it should be remembered that there were six children, um, you know, that they were all at 13 and in that. And you had Dwayne, who was 13. Um, you had Jade, who was 10. Um, John was 9. Uh, Jaden was 5. Jesse was 6. Jack was 7. And these six children are no longer here. And it's just, it's so sad. It really is. And I really do hope he never gets out again. I do. Uh, uh, it's just this is a real hard one. It really is. And like I say, I don't think he thought that would be the outcome. I just don't think he cared. He didn't care. It was all about me. And it always had been. Like I say, if you watch Britain's Darkest Taboos, and it, it goes back to when he was, you know, he was 19 in the army. 
you, you'll get an idea of, you know, what that man became. And he, he's a monster. He's an absolute monster. Um, and that's, that's my opinion on this really, really sad case. Um, if you've got any thoughts or anything, drop it in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. And, um, yeah, if you'd like to subscribe, um, for my next video I'd really appreciate it and yeah thank you so much for joining me see you soon